Good evening, Jeremy. Hi. Hello. Well, good Let afternoon. Comment on your... Carry on. I was going to comment on the music. Um, other than the little guitar bit for the last five minutes, it was so bad it drove my wife to bed. <laughs> very good, very good. Now, Jeremy, before I, I hit you with my first question, we actually presented it to the audience and we wanted to, to work out whether they thought the bubble had burst or if there was some more pain to come. So, Lyndon, if we could get just the, the audience results and that'll maybe give us some direction on who you're talking to. So, Jeremy, 46% of the people think that there's more pain to come. 31% think that the correction has already happened and 24% are unsure. So let's, let's help those 24% that are unsure. I'm gonna ask you that same question. Jeremy, has the bubble you warned about in 2021 deflated and are we in a new bull market? I don't think we're in a new bull market. There's never been a bull market in history that started from such high prices. And by a lot, this, this is not even close. Uh, but whether we're going to go straight down and how badly, that's a more interesting issue. We were deflating quite nicely from the kind of tech classic bubble 2021 when um, a series of things got in the way to mess it up. And the main one being artificial intelligence. It is, it is serious. It's going to turn out to be very important in almost everybody's life. Uh, but I wish it hadn't arrived just now because the the end of these great bubbles is hard enough anyway without having kind of the elements of new bubbles come in to scramble the thinking. And that's precisely what, what has happened here. A, a dozen giant American stocks have had a hell of a run on the back of AI. And uh, that has certainly created the impression that it's game over. The problem is prices are incredibly high and basically the economy is beginning to unravel. And uh, so it, it, it's a head fake, but it's a hell of a head fake and AI will be around for decades. And, and Jeremy, when you look across the landscape, are there parts of the market where you are seeing evidence of bubble-like bubble activity? The surprising thing about the whole 2021 speculative bubble is that how concentrated it was in the US. A bit like 2000, which was rather similar. And uh, outside the US, it's surprising how reasonable uh, stocks have been, whether it's emerging or, or developed or almost everywhere. They, they're mostly overpriced, but uh, ho-hum, they're overpriced in the old traditional kind of reasonable way. The, the US equity market led by the growth stocks became a frenzy of meme stocks and craziness, uh, led incidentally by the biggest investment I ever made nine years ago, QuantumScape, in, in a startup. And it came as a, as a SPAC, which I hate. I think they should be illegal. It came as a SPAC at 10, as they always are, uh, at the end of um, 2020 when the market was going up rapidly and getting interesting. And that was four times my money. But in two months, it went to 131. At 131, this company that had four years before it had a product, forget profits or sales, it had nothing for four years and was selling for more than General Motors or Panasonic. There was nothing at that scale in 1929 or 2000. This was probably one of the great speculative events of all time. And QuantumScape was, was another meme stock. I was so close, I didn't realize. But it led the way up, and it was a huge scale, as were some of the other meme stocks. Jeremy, GMO across, uh, invests across all asset classes or multiple asset classes. What does look attractive? Where do you see value at the moment? First, let me say that, that I haven't run money for 15 years. My job description is worrying about long-term underrated problems. And I got to say it's been a hell of a 15 years because there's been a lot of world-class underrated problems, and there still are. 
they're probably as as impressive a package of long-term problems as there has been in modern times, in my opinion. And if you want to know the, my honest opinion is that we will be less than 50-50 likely to come through these things uh, intact with a with the steady, relatively steady civilization that we've enjoyed for the last 70, 80 years. I think that is eroding at the edges already and will continue to erode. And even if we do better, we'll, we'll go through periods of substantially more pain than we have had yet. But I do follow, I have to invest my foundation. The foundation is a billion and a half and it's unbelievably important to us. And we put 75% of it into early stage venture capital. I believe venture capital is the very, very best part of American capitalism. It's the best in the world. It's attached to 15 great research universities, 15 of the best 20 in the world. And uh, that's a very important connection. It attracts wonderful young people from all over the world. You, you find in real life that over a quarter of the leaders of every company you bump into in the venture capital world are foreign born. It's really quite amazing. So I have 75% there and in the foundation, therefore we fight with illiquidity. And, um, and so we're very careful with the remaining 25%. It's short the market and, uh, it's, and it's liquid that can be sold in a day or two. In terms of what I would do if I if I had that money and didn't have a mission to invest in, in green venture capital, um, I would still be careful. I would underweight the US. I would overweight equities outside. I would be very careful with real estate all over the world. The last 20 years of declining mortgage rates have driven real estate to really crushing high multiples of family income so high that young people can't buy a house. And that applies every bit as much in the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and, and, most, and China, and most of Europe. So I wouldn't touch real estate. I think farms and forests have been driven up by the decline in interest rates, and basically American stocks. I would concentrate on non-US stocks. If I had to buy US stocks, and most people do, I would, I would concentrate on quality. I am very nervous about the economy and quality protects you to some considerable degree. I'm very nervous about an eventual financial trouble and, and quality does a good job on that respect. They have far less debt uh, than the rest of the world. And uh, quality is the major aberration in the efficient market. Top quality stocks should yield a point less, just like AAA bonds yield a point less, but they do not. In real life, for the last 100 years or 50 years or 10 years, quality stocks have yielded an extra half a point. It is a major aberration that French and Farmer and the boys completely missed back in the day, and, it, and it's the major inefficiency that you should take advantage of. So if you have to buy U.S., Make sure you buy quality. In the long run, of course, I love climate change stocks. They will have an incredible top line revenue growth driving forward like Tesla and electric vehicles versus the dopey VWs and uh, old fashioned cars. And uh, the world of climate change is finally waking up. Governments all over, over the world are getting behind it. They're subsidizing it, particularly the IRA in the US. But they're really encouraging it in almost every country in the world, particularly in China, who have a dominant position in almost everything green. So this is the, wind, the area with the wind in your sails. And to, to fight it would be a, a terrible mistake. So I have some of my foundation some of my longest term money in, in climate change. Jeremy, you've mentioned China a few times there. It's obviously highly relevant for the audience today. 
Should Australians be worried about the economic slowdown we're seeing in China? Yeah, I think the uh, China has done a, a, a hero's job, really, of carrying the world's growth. They've contributed well over a third of the last 15 years. And uh, growing at 10 or 12%, that was something, particularly in resources so important to Australia. They, they for 20 years, they grew their resource demand at some astonishing six, seven, eight percent number. And then for the last four or five, accelerated to double digit. In a 30 year window, they went from, from 5% of the world's coal to 50, from 5% of the world's cement to 50. And uh, similarly across the board, but they, but they were the stars. And Jeremy, in Australia, we have this uh, beautiful endowment of natural resources, um, companies, like Rio Tinto and BHP have, have grown off the back of that journey that you've just outlined. You've also talked about your enthusiasm for, for vehicles like Tesla. Presented with the opportunity to put your money into large cap miners like BHP and Rio, or a basket of lithium stocks, which would you choose? <laughs> I, I would uh, attempt to duck. Um, <laughs> what, what I... What I uh, what I didn't say is the, the only two uh, tradable liquid securities that I own are relatively small positions in, in climate change and resources. They, because they're the great long-term cases. We don't have enough uh, metals uh, to get to green the global economy. We don't have enough lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper, these are all scarce resources. Since about 2002, the world has gone through a sharp turning point. For 100 years, the entire 20th century, the price of the average important commodity stock uh, came down. And it came down a lot. Over 100 years, it came down 70%. Almost uh, a, a little over 1% a year. That is a hell of a help in getting rich. So. The index of 100 came down to 30. And then after 2002, until today, it's gone back to 90. It's tripled. The world has changed. It used to be technology more than made up for the deeper holes and the thinner ores. And now they do not. There's still technology, but the shortage is more powerful and the technology is less powerful than it was for 100 years. And now, on average, irregularly, and in that horrible lurching way that we all hate so much in resources, the prices are going up. We live in a world now of occasional, not occasional, of fairly regular shortages. We call it whack-a-mole in America. You hit one, it goes down, you have a glut for a year or two, but there are three other shortages. And then the original shortage comes back again. We are not going to be rolling in commodities ever again. That era has gone. It is going to be more painful finding resources and more expensive and, of course, slightly inflationary and slightly depressing on growth rate compared to the good old days. And, and Jeremy, you've talked about your passion. All right. Quite... I, I, let me come back to your lithium. Of course, we, we don't have enough lithium even to begin to get the job done. And we're going to have to design our way around lithium ion into sodium ion, which is already on the road, by the way. And, and we will. Uh, and lithium, however, for high grade is the best. And, and there will be an intermittent shortage as far as the eye can see. And I have invested in extracting more lithium from brine and extracting more lithium from rock in, in Australia. And it would be a good long-term investment. Bear in mind, every commodity is a royal pain to own because it, because it has totally unpredictable and shocking drops along the way. But your alternative to own uh, a broad swath of other metals will also be attractive. I would do both, but only if you know your nerves are strong. Jeremy, you've, you've talked about your passion for investing in, in climate businesses and, and, 
and companies solving that challenge. But we're constantly faced with negative and bearish headlines on that topic. What are you optimistic about and what are you bullish about on that front? You're constantly faced with bearish headlines on what? On climate. As in climate will be bad or? As in climate will be mean? bad, climate is changing, temperatures are going up. Yes, it, it, it is, of course, a nightmare and it's getting so much worse in the last couple of years. And um, personally, I welcome it because it's woken everybody up and it was like dealing with sleepwalkers before that. Uh, when you see something terrible coming down the pipeline and nobody taking it seriously, that is a bit of a nightmare. And that that phase at least is over. Um, yeah, it will dominate the portfolios of the rest of your lives, guys. Do not do not be in any doubt. It doesn't mean there won't be financial problems. It doesn't mean there won't be bubbles. There have been at least one already, and there'll be probably a couple more. Any industry that is dominant and growing has bubbles and has problems. But it will be, it will be the sector of the economy that drives more growth than anything else. Can I get you to be a bit more specific on some of the opportunities that you're seeing in that space? Um, I'll tell you what we need to save our bacon. We need plentiful supply of, of green, cheap energy. And yes, solar wind is a very promising start. It, you may not realize how much more dramatically cheap that is than was estimated by all the authorities as recently as 10 years ago and 15 years ago. They have made spectacular progress and particularly in storage, which is down over 10 years below 10 cents on the dollar. But in order to make a real job of renewable energy, you need another big reduction in storage. I think you'll get it. Everywhere we look, we bump into great research groups both for lightweight EV batteries and for large scale industrial batteries. Different technologies, different ideas, but there are research groups all over the world working on these things. I think it's quite reasonable to expect that in 10 years or 15, the cost of storage will be down another, down to another 10% of what it is today. Beyond that, I'm interested in fusion. We have two or three investments. There are 30, 40 new companies around the world engaged in fusion. My guess is that it's quite likely that one or more of them will be successful in the next two or three decades. I think uh, geothermal is very promising. The energy and development that went on in fracking in the US 200,000 wells were drilled, trial and error, ingenuity, sweat and tears, and, and they covered amazing ground. And uh, I think it's quite likely you could take that talent, some of that talent, move it over to geothermal and have multiples of expansion and reduction in cost in geothermal. And I even think there's some possibility that they will find uh, uh, free occurring hydrogen uh, naturally occurring in the Earth's crust. Uh, but that is a, a long shot, which I wouldn't suggest you chase after yet. Jeremy, a change, slight change of tack. You, you talked earlier about uh, expensive property and the, and the problems of inequality or the struggles that was creating for people. I might start you off by, by just asking on what is a, a favourite topic for Australians. What sort of returns do you think Australians can expect out of property over the next decade or so? <laughs> I, I always like to say we're an optimistic species. I think it's a survival characteristic. I think we survived only because we were optimistic. And I think the most optimistic countries are, are the US and Australia. And in some ways, <laughs> Australia is, is the most optimistic. And one of the indicators I like to say is if, if, if you want to challenge the housing market and suggest it's in for a bump uh, in, in the UK or the US, you'll have a civilized conversation. If you do it in Australia, you'll have World War III. 
I mean, they'll string, <laughs> they'll string you up if they can catch you. And uh, the, the, the key here is what is a house selling as a multiple of the average family's income? And it started back in 98. It was three and a half times in London. It's now 10 or 12. It was about three times in the US. It's now five or six. It was about three times in Australia. God knows what it is. You know better than me, <laughs> but double digit, I would think. And uh, how a 10 times family income, how does the average guy, how does the average woman, how does the average person uh, get to buy a new house? It, it is inequality, I think, is the poison in the capitalist system these days. Inequality has increased in almost every developed country, certainly in the UK and Australia and Canada, but massively in the US. The US now is as unequal as Mexico and Brazil, which is to say very, very unequal. And, and, and the price of getting there has been that the average guy working an hour has not, does not receive more than 10 percent more than they did in 1975 if you adjust for inflation and yet the economy has been pretty good all of the benefits of the productivity have gone to the top 10 percent a lot of that to the top one percent this is not a good way to run a ship you 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 end up with the disgruntlement of almost everybody almost everybody in america feels that quote this country needs to be saved from the rich and powerful that was the exit poll question, the only question that got everyone to agree, whether they were Hindu or Christian or Jewish, whether they were whether they were Democrats or Republicans, everybody agreed. And they are right. The U.S. does need, need to be saved from the rich and powerful. And there's an element of that, uh, certainly in the U.K. I can't speak to Australia, but I suspect there is a whiff of that, too. And Jeremy, what's the circuit breaker for the path that we're on with regards to inequality? Is there a circuit breaker? There's a circuit breaker to the social contract and the social goods. All social goods, number of people in prison, life expectancy, general health, attitudes to your neighbors, all of that is highly correlated with income equality. If you want to have a healthy society, it is easy to do. All you have to do is move income equality in the right direction. Now you can do that through taxes. You can do it by having the unions become a little stronger. You can do it many ways, and we need to. The pendulum has swung a long, long way. Look, I, I came out of England in the era of the unions when, when you couldn't do business in England. And I'm a fan of Thatcher. There, there are times when you have to shock the system and make it more capitalistic. There are times when you have to shock it and move it back a bit. And we have come too far for the time being. From 1960 straight up, income has concentrated at the top, at the CEO level. When I arrived in America, the average Fortune 500 CEO, 40 times the average worker, which seems decent. And in Japan, it was the same. Today, in Japan, it's about the same, 40, 45 times. In America, it's 300 times. What is the point of that? What do you do with all that dough? <laughs> well, and I've made a lot of dough, but I, I've given, <laughs> I, I have given 95% of it to, to our foundation, and we are doing, I think, something pretty useful, certainly something very exciting, by the way, and interesting. I do recommend it. If you're going to retire, this is one hell of a project. Very good. Well, Jeremy, we've got just a few minutes left and I've got a couple of questions that I really want to put to you. So if we can whip through a few more, that'd be amazing. Um, my first question is, what probability do you assign to a, a US recession over the next 18 months? Certainly larger than 0.5. Um, it's always underestimated. The Fed and the establishment, the economic establishment, the financial establishment, they always underestimate the probability of a recession. And after the great bubble, 1929, 2000, perhaps 1972, 
honorary member and the housing bubble of, of 08. There is always a recession. And Japan, of course, the mother and father of all super bubbles. Uh, a massive lost decade. And in 1929, a depression. You always have them. And yet they always say everything will be fine. This is not unusual. It's absolutely inevitable. And here they go again. I think it would be unique if we don't have an extended problem with the economy. And uh, I said more than 0.5. If I had to put a number on it, I guess I'd say about 0.7. Very quickly, Jeremy, you wrote this awesome article, Reinvesting When Terrified, back in the you know, 2008, 2009 period. No, For no, the people 2009, in the room. 2009, the day the market hit its low. <laughs> March, <laughs> March the 9th, I think. So in just a couple of words, for the people in the room, what are your tips to them about making the most of opportunities when markets are irrational and terrified? Yeah, just persuade yourself that the world is typically wrong. The world is typically too optimistic, too willing to go with the group. And even on those rare occasions when it's bearish, it so attaches itself to the group that it can't change its mind and, and runs off the cliff and can't get back on. Hence, you're able to write, even as someone who is seen as a bear, I was able to write reinvesting when terrified, get a plan together, get your tail back in the stock market. Of course, you're terrified. That's the nature of a major bear market. So stay clear of the crowd, think for yourself and, and recognize that they are on average optimistic. It's what we do. So we're always looking for better outcomes than historically are typical. Well, Jeremy, I think that that's a, a great point for us to wrap up the conversation. We could chat for hours, but I'm sure it's, it's, uh, it's getting late there. I just wanted to thank you on the behalf of Livewire and all the people that are here uh, this morning uh, that you've taken the time to speak with us. Um, and if I could ask everyone to please put their hands together for Jeremy. Jeremy.